Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. So we're um, coming to the, the conclusion of our four-part series on purpose. We're calling it Living on Purpose. And, and we want this to be about that great work that each of us is, has a work that God has begun in us and that we are to reveal it into the world. I think it's interesting that so much of our teaching and new thought and unity is about the personal path of of growth and revealing who we are. And yet, as we're breaking apart our statement here at the church, our church's purpose statement, in community, we nurture and empower each other, transforming our lives that we may serve the world. The three of those four weeks, or the topics for this sermon series, are about the collective, about how we do this personal work of healing, of recovery, of uh, delivery of who we are, that we serve, it all, it all serves the whole. That's, that's the point here. So, I think it's interesting that we're talking about a very, very personal journey of healing and becoming, the work that God has planted in us, but we do it in the context of relationship. And that's a good thing. Speaking of relationship, my partner John Moore is on a trip back to uh, the east to see his family there. His siblings all live in the northeast. And so I've been left to my own devices now for a couple of weeks. And he and I are different. Um, We're on the Myers-Briggs personality test. I'm an ENFJ and he's an ENFP. So we're a lot the same. But the, the J is a judging type, not judgmental not judgmental, and a P is a perceiving type. If you don't want to know, the way that we're different is this. A few weeks ago, um, we went sh- shampoo shopping for the very first time together, and we're in Target, and we, we go to the shampoo aisle. Now, I've been buying my own shampoo since I was 18, and it's not a big deal, or it doesn't take much time. We spent 15 minutes <laughs> in the shampoo aisle while John compared products and ingredients sampled the fragrance of each one, compared the price per ounce. I wasn't annoyed, but I was fascinated. (laughs) I've never known that you could spend 15 minutes in the Target shampoo aisle picking out shampoo. So just for example, since John is gone and I'm at home, left to my own devices, I'm out of shampoo. So yesterday I'm shopping for other things at Whole Foods and I'm like, I bet they have shampoo here. Sure enough, I go right to the aisle. I see, oh, that one has uh, citrus and grapefruit. I like that. I grab it. I go check out. This morning, I'm washing my hair, and I'm like, oh, this isn't shampoo. It's conditioner. (laughs) So the point being, our differences are good. (laughs) That we don't all have to be alike. We don't need people to be just like us. That we can serve each other by being who we are. So I just want to share. I did find some shampoo, so my hair is clean, just so you know. (laughs) So this is week three. We're taking that line from our purpose statement, transforming our lives. This is the the one of the four series that is about the very personal journey. Last week I had mentioned that there's some work in our spiritual lives that we cannot do on our own. We must do in relationship or community. And today I would say just the opposite. This work of transformation cannot be done by anybody but you. You are the only one that can do the healing work, the the revealing work of this transformative path that we call unity, that we call new thought. There's a Bible verse I often like to bring into uh, conversation about um, spiritual transformation, personal transformation. It comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 2. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may determine God's will, God's will that is perfect. Many unity churches have a portion of that scripture placed above the entry to their sanctuary. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, our our teaching, our tradition is called new thought because we understand that thought is the portal to personal transformation. 
that the thoughts that we think, that we hold in mind, the thoughts we think about ourselves, our bodies, our lives, our relationships, our world, are creative. And if we want to have a different experience of life, if we want to get better, we begin with our thinking. Now, there is a lot of uh, teaching, and there are a lot of techniques and tools and practices that we can take up to do that work of rewriting our thought system. And I'm not going to have time to go into all that today. I'm going to talk about more of the kind of um, container of transformative thinking. But I really encourage you to take part in our series starting next month, the, the Touchstone series, because that's the whole six weeks are going to be about how we can build better thoughts into our lives and dis- demonstrate better experiences. That's what that's all about. But today I want to focus on this idea of personal transformation as being an evolutionary process. You know, in some traditions there is a, there is a before and then there's an after, and it's a one-time thing. You were unsaved and now you're saved. It's all done. Or you were unenlightened, now you're enlightened. It's all done. You were unawakened, now you're awakened. That's not the way we understand transformation in unity and in new thought. It is an evolutionary process. It's one transformation to the next transformation forever. And here's why it's forever, because God is infinite. And we're never going to get to the, the full expression and embodiment of the presence of God within us. There's always more. And this is good news. If you're going through a tough time, it can get better. If you're in having the best time of your life, it can get better. So back to this scripture verse. The, um, the word there for renewal, I want to focus on that. In the Greek, it is anakinosis. I think I got that right. Anakinosis. Kinosis has to do with um, newness. And together, this, this word, what it forms is an idea of renewing in English, but also reforming, recreating, rebuilding. And it's not a reboot, it's an upgrade. This is inherent in the original Greek. That it's not just like, I mean, have you ever had to reboot and go back to factory settings on any of your devices? You lose all of the, the gains that you've added in your software that you've added or the, the documents you built. You don't want that. You want to incorporate and integrate all the learning that you've had up until now, but to go to a fresh new platform of becoming and being who you truly are. And so as we renew Anakinos, as we renew, make something new but better, but brighter than what it's been before, we begin to live our lives from this higher place. This word, anakinosis, is only in the Bible twice. And the verb form, which I'm not going to share with you right now because I've already messed up the the noun form, it's also in the Bible twice. And one of those is in Colossians, chapter 3, verse 10. You have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. That seed of perfection resides within us because we are made in the image and the likeness of the Most High. And every problem that we have, every struggle that we face, every illness that we have to walk through is an opportunity for us to release that which stands in the way of the image of God's perfection within us. All of our work is releasing what stands in the way of who we already are, which is why we don't have one of those one and done kind of experiences of transformation. That none of us is, it, well, here's the paradox of it, none of us is perfect and each of us is perfect. That each of us is created in the image of perfection and nobody is complete with their work. So this brings me to um, the idea, not of the mechanics of building transformation, but what, what is the mindset? What is the, who do we need to be? How do we need to be in order to allow transformation to happen in our lives? And I've been thinking about this for a few days and trying to find the right word. It has to do with flexibility. It has to do with teachability. It has to do with resilience. Because you see, if you're fixed and stuck, if you've got, well, or if you just think you got it all figured out, 
If that is, you know, I don't have any more transformation to do. I have, hey, <laughs> I've got it. No, nobody got it. And so the word I finally ended up settling on was humility. That what is required for spiritual and personal transformation is humility. And, and humility does not mean the same thing as being humiliated. It means being right-sized. You know, it's... Um, it's kind of a paradox in our teaching. I keep using that word, and I was going to save that for my last point. But anyway, it keeps coming up. That each of us is uniquely created in the image of the divine. We are perfect, irreplaceable, unrepeatable expressions of God. Do you get how special you are? And so is everybody else. So you're not more special than anyone else. That's humility where you can own the greatness of the God presence within your own life and the God purpose that you're being called to live into, you can really feel the power of your, individual, your individualized expression of God, but not be over anyone. That's humility. It's not being less than. It's not being greater than. It's being right-sized. And so the, the way to allow God's perfect work to be perfected in you, thank you for that song, Tony, is to be humble and realize you got work to do, is to stop trying to think you got it all figured out. So the opposite of humility would be what? Arrogance. If you're feeling like you're, you're all that, well, maybe. <laughs> maybe, you, maybe ask your wife. She might have a different opinion. Maybe there is a little bit of work you could still do there. What's the opposite of flexibility? Rigidity. How are you with new ideas and new ways of being? How are you with new things to try? Resilience. What's the opposite of resilience? I don't know. I guess it would just be give up and die. <laughs> just quit. We're talking about perseverance that is needed to do the spiritual work. We have to be willing, and that's really the word, I guess, too, is willingness as opposed to willfulness. There's a passage in the, the book of Jeremiah in the Hebrew scriptures, which I want to share with you. Chapter 18, verse 1 through 4. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. And then Jeremiah speaking, I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred, was imperfect, it was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. There is a teaching in New Thought. Ernest Holmes had this beautiful quote that says this, There is a power greater than I am in the universe, and I can use it. And it's true. But there is another way of holding that truth, which is this. There is a power greater than I am in the universe, and it can use me. That is being the clay in the hand of the master potter. There are four stages of spiritual evolution that Michael Beckwith and others have taught to me, by me, through me, as me. At the first stage of spiritual consciousness, there is only this power greater than me and that I am at its whim. At the second level, we arise to a level of consciousness, know that I am empowered with choice. I can choose my thought. I can choose my experience. It's by me. I move from the to me to the by me. And many people in unity, in new thought, that's where they want to be and they want to stay right there where I get to decide, I get to choose the parameters of what my life is going to look like and I'm going to affirm it until the cows come home and ain't nothing going to happen. Except here's the deal. Even our highest affirmation is still being informed by our human mind, by our egoic experience. And so there may be a little flaw somewhere in that consciousness, which then will demonstrate into our lives. And the story of the potter in the potter's house is that there is a higher power that sees the wholeness. And if we're willing, if we're available, if we're flexible, if we are just open and humble to this higher intelligence that is higher than we can currently embody as an individual, God can reshape us 
And sometimes the thing that we've been that we've been resisting, the thing that we're trying to pray away is the very way God is seeking to reshape our lives into a more useful, more purposeful pattern. You know, I've, I've talked so much about my recovery experience, but that's my experience. That's been my biggest lesson so far in how spiritual things work. And man, did I just try and wish it away. There was actually an affirmation I found on how to not be alcoholic. And I, I affirmed that I affirmed that I affirmed. It didn't work. The thing that I did not want to be the truth of my life ended up being the very portal that flaw, that, that thing that just, oh, God, I would rather anything than be an alcoholic. But when I finally found some humility and sought some help and some very simple, spiritual, practical things I could do, working with a sponsor and in a group, I found the healing and that that flaw was reshaped and made me the vessel that I am. Now, that continues to be true for me and for you as well. If you're willing to not try and push away, but rather open. So as we move from the by me, the, the portal from the second to the third kingdom of consciousness is surrender. That there is a higher intelligence than you can currently know in this individualized expression or embodied expression. There is a higher intelligence and it can use you for a holy purpose. And here's the great part about that. My friend Kathy Young says it this way. Even if we are a channel of God, and God moves through us, the pipe gets wet too. That the blessings that come through you bless your own life. As you're willing to serve others, and we're going to talk more about that next week, you are served. You are blessed by this experience. So now I want to talk about Transformation as paradox, as mystery. I searched and searched and searched for the right illustration for this part of today's message. I looked at Harry Potter. I looked at, the, you know the little story of the princess and the frog? The original in the Grimm Brothers was the frog prince. And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you all a fairy tale. None of it felt like it really landed right. So I'm coming back to the tried and true, the best, not even a story, the best illustration of transformation I know, and it's the, the old caterpillar. <laughs> you know what a caterpillar is, right? Any tomato gardeners out there? There's a particular brand of caterpillar that likes tomato vines and tomatoes. Growing up in Oklahoma, we just call them tomato worms or mater worms. I'm, uh, I am really not a great gardener. I don't even, right, where I'm at right now in my home, I don't even have a, a, any dirt to plant anything in, just a few things in pots here and there. But in a previous homes, I'd like to plant some tomatoes. If nothing else, a few herbs and a few tomatoes. And in, in a home in Dallas that I had once, I had a little spot by the garage where I had planted five or six tomato vines. I go out one morning, and this vine had not yet put on any fruit, but the blooms were there, and it had just sprouted so beautifully, and it was growing. A whole section of it was gone, just from one, overnight, and I knew what had happened, because <laughs> I had grown up around tomato gardening, tomato worms, and I found that tomato worm, and I fed him to the ducks next door. I know that he, I know he's going to turn into a beautiful luna moth. I'm not interested. He was getting in the way. <laughs> Don't get in the way of a tomato man and his homegrown tomatoes, Okay. <laughs> So I, then I started watching these tomato vines, and there would be one, just a little, tiny little green caterpillar. And one day I decided, just to see how fast these things destroy my tomato vines, I let him alone. I'm not kidding, overnight he had grown by an inch and had taken out a whole section of that vine. To the ducks he went, I'm telling you, as <laughs> quick as I could. There are, there are plenty of those moths around. That's not my job, right? I need those tomatoes. All right. So a caterpillar is an eating machine. Its whole purpose is to find energy in the form of calories and put those into its body and store them. That's all it does. Its whole purpose. The whole purpose for the stage of life that, that caterpillar is, is to eat. And then at some point, what happens in the life of that caterpillar, it says, I've had enough. Something switches in its tiny little caterpillar brain and the hormones that move through its body and the signal is this part is over. 
I know many of you are looking for that little switch in your own brain right now with all the, the stress eating we're doing in this pandemic. Well, if I could just find that little switch that said, enough. But the caterpillar does, and it stops eating. And it finds a place a little hidden away, maybe under a leaf of some poor sap's tomato vine. And it plants, and it attaches by the rear, and then it hangs down. And then the next thing that happens particularly about a butterfly I'm talking about, is that the outer skin of the caterpillar hardens and shifts, turns into a protective casing called a chrysalis. And that's when things really get weird. <laughs> the caterpillar, you see, I always thought, this is what I thought, that inside that chrysalis, the caterpillar just somehow rearranges itself and then turns into butterfly. Like those wings were probably already in the caterpillar body, I just couldn't see them. That's actually not what happens. Do you know this? What happens in the chrysalis, protected, hidden from view, is that the body of the caterpillar disintegrates. It turns into a, an organic soup. It does. The whole body just melts into this liquefied... If you were to cut open a chrysalis at this point, it would just be goop. There is no little baby butterfly in there. It's just... Ugh. How many of you feel like your lives are doing that right now in the transformation you're personally going through? Where there's, there's no form, there's no sense of this. But in that organic soup are these things called imaginal discs, sometimes called imaginal cells. And they were there in the caterpillar's body. And they form, they, they align themselves in the soup of the caterpillar stuff. And they begin to draw the nutrients and the cells that were present there. And they begin to build a new body that is very little in common, has very little in common with the body of the caterpillar. And in the right time, and in the right steps, that new body is formed. And then it emerges at the right time and becomes a beautiful butterfly, which has a whole different purpose. It's not about eating, it's about pollinating, it's about um, creating new little caterpillars to eat other people's tomatoes, it's about, it's about moving life forward it has a very different purpose that is much, I mean we could just place our own human experience on top of it, it's, it's selfless many of you are in the caterpillar experience and many of you are in the chrysalis <laughs> the life that you have been living isn't working anymore for many, many years even, that that job just was it. You were great, you were moving along, and then it's lost its savor. It's no longer fulfilling you in the way that it used to. Or maybe something outside, like a global pandemic, or an unexpected illness, or uninvited divorce. Something has shattered the life that you thought you were going to have forever. And it's all come apart. What I want to tell you is a paradox. It's not okay when things fall apart. That is our experience. And at the same time, everything is okay. Both are true. And it's okay for us to grieve the life that we're losing. To grieve the things that are going away and what that meant to us. It is perfectly okay to feel the pain of that loss. And in that same instant... Latch on to the hope and the faith that something new is being built in your life that is so much greater. It's not a reboot, it is an upgrade. Something is being drawn into your experience and if you're willing to be available to God, if you're willing to bring your own intentionality and your own sense of purpose into that goop that you're currently swimming in, God will use it and bring you into a space of such freedom and empowerment. Ralph Waldo Emerson says this, we cannot let our angels go. And we do not see that they only go out that our archangels may come in. The thing that you're just holding on to, can you imagine that little caterpillar like, what is happening? I've got to hold this together. The last thing that happens in the goop process is the head pops off. 
The head is still there trying to figure it out. To all my beloved, beautiful brothers and sisters who are control freaks, this is a difficult process for you. (laughs) To trust something you can't control, oh my God. It's the only way. It's the only way of spiritual transformation is to get your intellect and everything you can figure out out of the way and trust that something good is happening. Let the angel go that your archangel may come in. I want to conclude here with um, a little bit of a reading. It's actually a bit of a sermon by my, oh, I just love this woman, Barbara Brown Taylor. Barbara Brown Taylor is a professor and an Episcopal priest and an author. And she does a beautiful teaching on darkness. And wrote, it was a sermon where I first heard and then later it became a whole book called Learning to Walk in the Dark. And you see what... What we know is that there are so many examples in scripture and in spiritual teachings about how God is light and we are light and we are here to be light and sometimes we are not there. But Barbara says that if we will turn in 180 degrees, we will see there is also a deep truth that God is in the darkness as well. And whatever you're going through collectively or individually, if you're in a dark place, God is present. That right now, you are being transformed. Barbara Brown Taylor writes this. It will never sell, I know that. Endarkenment is never going to appeal to anyone the way that enlightenment does. Well, except maybe to the people who are already sitting in the dark, thinking they've done something wrong, that God has abandoned them that they have lost their ways and may never find them again, to hear the gospel that God dwells in darkness might save them on the spot, along with any of us who are listening in, because if we haven't already been there, we will be by and by. No one who follows Jesus gets a rain check. No one who's human gets to bypass the dark cloud. But here's the thing about the dark cloud of unknowing which even the saints take on trust. It is not there to get through like a test or a fever. It is God's home. It is God's home, the place where God dwells. To be invited into the dark is a great honor, and to stay a while, even better. Those who come out can be hard to look at at first. Where did all that brightness come from in that dark cloud? And they may not have a lot of words to describe where they've been. But even the limping ones will tell you this, that they would never have chosen it, not in a million years. But now that it's happened, they would never give it back. Something is happening here. I've been saying that since the first day I became senior minister at Unity of Houston. I can feel there is a movement of change and transformation in this church that is needed on this planet at this time. Individuals are being awakened to a higher way of being, of greater service and greater witness to the transformational power of God. And it is happening to you if you're within the sound of my voice. And you may be in that place of deep darkness and unknowing. And I'm here to remind you that this is part of your becoming. You can trust it. You can trust God. You're amazing. And if no one has told you today that they love you, I love you. God bless you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.